So, my friends, my name is Steve Guttenberg. My guest today is Bob Clear at Mountain. If you own any records, you look on the credits, you're going to see his name there. It's pretty amazing what you've done. You've worked with the Stones and Springsteen and Bowie and even the Ramones. It's, it's a funny thing about that is that I was a big, huge Ramones fan. Oh, okay. And um, apparently I recorded the Ramones, but I can't remember doing it. <laughs> That's hilarious. And I knew Tommy Erdeli really well because he used to hang around Power Station. He was a friend of, of Tony Bon Jovi's. And, and, um, and, but I, and, and it's so funny because um, Eddie Stasium, who did most of the Ramones stuff uh -huh. and produced them and takes takes but, credit and he should have credit. He called me a couple of years ago, he was doing a compilation and said, um, said Look, you, I'd like to get a quote from you about working with the Ramones. And uh -huh. I said, I don't think I ever did. He goes, no, <laughs> you did. And then he sent me copies of the track sheets with my handwriting. Right. You know? So yeah, I did. Do you think maybe, you don't remember because it, it was, it, they just knocked it out, it was so fast that there's not was, much to remember? It was just one day, I was really feel, just filling in for Eddie Stasium, okay. and okay. Uh, I'm pretty sure, and it was just, and, but I'm next, I recorded four songs, I think, something uh -huh. like that. And, uh, but yeah, it's, it's so weird because I'm a, one of the biggest remotes fans. <laughs> You'd think I'd remember yeah. that. Yeah, that is kind of strange. And I, I was way past my drug days, too. You know? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's not the excuse. So what about, so the first Stones record you were involved in was Exile on Main Street? No, well, no, no, that was, a, the Exile on Main Street is really just, uh, I did a kind of a outtakes oh, okay. version oh, of that oh, just a few years ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. the first one was uh, Miss You. Oh, okay. I did a, a single mix. Well, it was originally a, just a 12-inch dance mix oh, okay. of Miss You, because I was, I was pretty known over at Atlantic Records for working with Sheik and Sister Sledge, because uh -huh. um, they had some huge dance hits. Uh -huh. And uh, so someone over there suggested to Nick, because he wanted a dance 12-inch extended dance mix uh -huh. of Miss You. He said, oh, use this guy, Clear Mountain. And then he liked my mix. He said, oh, we'll do the single mix as well. And then we, after that, we did Tattoo You, and it was time for that. But, you know, this is, this is a question that I've always wondered about, is when you start working with a band, how do you, how, in other words, how do you develop a rapport? How do you understand what it is that they're looking for? Um, well, the Stones was easy, because I was a Rolling Stones fan okay. when I was a kid. But it was unusual, because it was this sort of dance thing. Right, right, right. And, but it, it, it worked out because I had been working at Media Sound where I started. We did mostly R&B records, Cool and the Gang. I started with Cool and the Gang uh -huh, uh -huh. and Betty King and people like that. And so even though I was a, a rock child from the 60s and 70s, I had a bit of an R&B uh, background. And I'd been doing, obviously, working with Chic. Uh -huh. I had some, uh, a lot of, and so that combination uh -huh. Kind of worked perfectly, and so for for that, but um, yeah, as far as and, but other sort of more generic, if just if a new band, yeah, let's say working with a new band, how do you, how do you what lang? In other words, you have to develop some sort of language to, to communicate with each other. You know? Well, well, usually if if I can, it doesn't happen so much anymore. But it used to be, I'd actually work with them right. face to face, and I would ask them questions. I'd ask them first of all, what was it about? You know what records of mine uh -huh. did they uh -huh. listen to that they thought, oh, we should get that guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that would kind of help a little I bit. See. And I then see. I just asked him about the music, and so I said, just give me a feeling <laughs> about what you feel about your music and who you are and what what the music is saying. But um, but how much of it is it? Does it come down to of like capturing how they actually sounded when they made the record? as opposed to making it into something better than they actually were? Well, I try to capture whatever the, the artist is about. Okay. You know, I try to go for their essence more than anything and, um, and get it to sound as good as, you know, this, the combination of that and making a record that's as enjoyable to listen to as possible. Right. You know, and if, I, if I'm not enjoying listening to it, I don't think anybody else will, but if I, li if I like it, it usually works out that somebody else will like it too, because I'm kind of the general public, I think. You know, even right. though this is what I do. But you know, I, I watched a video this morning, thinking about you know talking to you, 
and in one of them you were talking about mixing, and you made it seem like you were in this kind of, well, I'm just listening to it and listening, and then I did a, I add a little reverb here, a little this there. It made it seem like it just sort of, just sort of happens, right? <laughs> well, is, it, that, is that true? Is I, that I, still true? I think it is true because I don't have a, um, it's kind of stream of consciousness usually. Yeah. Because I'll put up a rough mix, basically. Right. And sometimes it's my assistant, whatever my assistant put up, it's usually just the faders all in a straight line because I mix on an analog desk. Okay. So it's a little Still. easier. Oh, only analog? Mix? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. And um, I use a lot of digital effects, and it's coming from digital and it's going okay. to digital. Okay, right. But it's an analog console, it's an SSL right. console. And, um, so it's just like a rough mix, and I'll just go through and and solo. I'll, I'll go through and solo each instrument to find out what what the okay. instrument or vocal what their contribution is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And what they're what they're actually doing, and then and then it's just I balance it. I I keep everything in. I keep the especially the vocal. That I always have the vocals in. Right. Well, yeah. Because you know, it's a, unless it's unless it's a Rolling Stones record, we want a very mixed vocal. <laughs> No, it's a, it's always the same, pretty much, and and uh, and then then it just yeah, kind of, you know, I play with it and like and anytime I hear a sound that's bugging me, I'll go and oh, what's wrong with that? Well, let me see if I can make that better. Let's see if I can make this snare drum a little better or get like, that guitar sound is a bit harsh, you know, that kind of thing. But you know what? I I think that's great, a great explanation. But here's my problem with your explanation. Okay. It sounds like anybody could do that. But it can't, you're, no, you're, but you're not anybody. <laughs> you're, you're like at the peak of your craft, so there's got to be more to it than that. Well, it seems to me that anybody should be able to do it. <laughs> okay. You know, I mean, if you like music, and uh, I don't know, it just, it just come, I guess simply because I've done it so much. And, right. And you just get to, get to be good at it after a while. But it does take time, right? It's not you can't do a song in a, in a, in a few hours, right? It would take more than a couple of hours to mix a song. Well, it depends. It depends. You know, I mean, are you trying to fix problems? In other words, uh, well, yeah. When there's problems, I mean, some of the live stuff can take some time because a lot of times there's problems with live stuff, like tuning vocals, because nobody sings in tune live. Uh -huh. But uh, if it's a well-produced studio record, I'll do two a day. Oh really? Oh sure. Really? Two yeah. records a day. Like when I work with Don Was, for an example. Yeah. He's such a great producer, uh -huh. and he, you know, he never puts a bunch of crap in there that's that's questionable. He knows exactly what the record needs, and and it's right to the point. And the arrangements are clean, and and oh, man, you just put it up and make this sound good. So no fixing it in the mix. Well, not not for. I mean, it's all different. Some some records, yeah, a lot of fixing. There's a, there's a few things that you got to do quite a bit of work, and you, you'll get like not everybody's a good Pro Tools recordist or editor, right. and so a lot of times you go through and you know it's clicks and pops because nobody's crossfaded their edits and things like that. But um, hopefully, my assistant. Well, I don't have an assistant anymore, but oh. when I did, right. that, he would he would fix all they that stuff them. before I get to it. But, um, you know, but, but you don't do a lot of, uh, you're not, you do mostly mixes, right? Not, you're not doing that much recording? No, just some recording, but not much. No, my main thing is, is mixing. And uh, I mean, so I, I do some recording for friends uh -huh. once in a while, if it's, you know, with somebody that, that I know, because we have a, a recording studio at Apogee, and so uh -huh. we'll go oh, over wow. there and record stuff. Uh -huh. And then I mix it at my place in my house, mix this. And uh, and once in a while I'll, sh I'll do arrangement things. You know, you just do a little edit. And you go, okay, well this keyboard should come in earlier or something. You know what I mean? You just do little things. And, uh -huh. So, so it seems like uh, I, I was watching also another interview you were talking about uh, mixing Bowie mm -hmm. and working. I'm sorry, Springsteen. Yeah. Springsteen, and he would say to you, uh, I just want it to be raw. Yeah. And as opposed to to clean? Is that what that means? Well, sometimes, yeah. My, my mixes would sound too good to them. Like, you go, look, that sounds, it's, it sounds too polished. It should be more aggressive and more, uh, you know, more like a demo. <laughs> you know? Oh, really? Or, uh, yeah, more, more raw, exactly. And, That's interesting. And so, because I tend to, 
like to hear every instrument really clearly, and usually that's fine. He's really cool with with most of that, but occasionally he'll, he'll go, no, I don't want to hear everything really clearly. It should be just like a, a mass of sound, you right. know. But it was really important to, uh, let's say, protect the vocal and his guitar, right? That, that's the main thing on the Springsteen record? Uh, well, the vocal, definitely. Yeah. Sometimes the guitar. Uh -huh. Sometimes he'll go, look, just turn my guitar down because I was... He'll, very often when he's recording, he's playing guitar while he's singing. Uh -huh. And so he calls his guitar playing, especially on electric guitar, uh, that, the, the primal scrub. Oh, yeah. yeah. When, uh, and sometimes it works and some, it doesn't always work. Uh -huh. So if it didn't work when they, were, when they were doing the recording, he, and he wouldn't listen to a playback and say, uh, I just want to do that guitar part, you know, make it a little better. It's not something well, he would do. Well, even if it's, if it's uh, not necessarily working, there's usually a place for it. You know what I mean? Okay. Like it's, if you put it underneath so you're not really hearing it, but it's adding to the, to the yeah, vibe yeah. of the song. Usually, I like to keep his original, whatever he did originally, mm -hmm. because he, even if you're not featuring it, it's... It's doing something. It's still doing something. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, but your first session with him was was Born to Run. No, no, that was. That's I came it. after that. The first okay. thing I did with him it was when Power Station first opened, and uh, he did. He was just starting the River album. Oh, okay. And I recorded uh, one song that never got made it to the album, a song called Roulette. We recorded and mixed it in two days. And he never put it on the record. Huh. He, re he released it later on one of the one of the compilations. And then another song called "The Ties That Bind" that I recorded. And then I was just starting. I was becoming a producer at the time. I had this demented view that I wanted to be a producer. That I, I later <laughs> wised up and realized that. I, okay, we should talk what, about that. What, though. What's, what, what is why? Why wouldn't you want to be a producer? Producer, you're more in control, right? Well, first of all, I don't really like producing. I don't. I have trouble kind of um, telling people what what to do, or, or uh, and I'm not really. A, I mean, I'm a bass player, uh -huh. but I'm not a real musician. Like I'm not <laughs> like a keyboard player that can go over and say, "Oh no, you should be playing this chord instead of that uh -huh, chord." Uh -huh. You know, and. And I work with a lot of really great producers, you know, like Don Was and Tony Berg and some of these guys, and they're they're incredible and they're so much better than anything that I could do. And I mean, I'm I'm a mix. I finally realized what I'm good at is mixing. It's, mixing, it's, it's yeah. something the advice that I kind of give to people if I do a seminar or something. I said, look, you know, figure out what you're good at and and figure out what you really like to do. And hopefully those two things are the same thing. Right, right, right. And if they're not the same thing, then learn how to like what you're good at and do that. Uh -huh. You know what I mean? Don't try to do something that you're not very good at, which right. is what me producing, I was trying to do something that I just wasn't great at, you know, and but I, I think, finally discovered. I, I think the thing about producing to, you know, you know people who buy music, it, I, I think they think of it as sort of like the, uh, the audio equivalent of directing a movie. And I yeah. think... Anybody who's in movies kind of knows what that is. Yeah. But but right. my impression, but you, you can correct me if I'm getting this wrong, is that a producer, a producer's role in making a record varies so much in terms of who the artist is That's and what they true. need from that producer. Right. So, and a lot of artists, like Dylan, for example, he doesn't use producers anymore. He just does it himself. Right. Because he feels like producers get in the way of what he's trying to do. Yeah, a producer. Because <laughs> I. I a friend of mine, Chuck Plotkin, produced a couple of, of Dylan records, and he said producing Dylan was like chasing him around with a microphone, because <laughs> Dylan will be in the, in the corner of the studio and he'll start playing and singing, and he's expecting to be recorded. Right, right. <laughs> and, and there better be a mic in front of him, you know? Wow. And so basically, yeah. it's, it's kind of a, yeah, that's a really different role for a producer. But then you have somebody like Mutt Lang that, dictates every note uh -huh. and sings a lot of them himself. Really? Yeah, and so that's a whole different... See, to me, that's... Being a good producer is somewhere in between those two uh -huh. things. You know, it's funny. I, I interviewed Don Was 
Oh, you uh, did? Maybe five, six years ago. Ah. And I asked him this question because it was the same theme of producing. Yeah. And I said, so what would have happened if the if if it worked out differently that the Rolling Stones had George Martin as a producer and the Beatles had uh, Andrew Luke Oldham? <laughs> Could you imagine what his, I'll tell you what his answer is, but could you imagine what he would say? Uh, I, I would have thought he was, it wouldn't have been that much different. <laughs> exactly. That's, yeah. that's what he said. He, yeah. he said that, um, Oops. Sorry, don't he said that um, for the early records, it wouldn't have made any difference because right. they just played the way they played in, in clubs, you know? But that's as think, the yeah. Beatles evolved, they needed George Martin. Yeah. They wouldn't have followed the same trajectory without George Martin. Right? Yeah, you're probably right, because they would have tried to do things that the producer would have not had a clue what right. to do. You right. know, they, they would have been just as creative, but uh, I think not having George, somebody that instead of saying, no, well, we can't do that, you know, that's, there's no way to do that. George right. Martin said, okay, let's figure out how to do that. Right. You know? So in that sense, the producer, depending on who the artist is and where they are in their career, the producer is, is an active member of the band. Yeah, yeah, can be. Yeah, I mean, he was like the fifth Beatle for sure. I mean, he's you know, obviously referred as that often. You know. uh, yeah, I mean, it, it really can be. I mean, especially when you, when you have a band that's that, that creative and they weren't necessarily that technical. Between him and Jeff Emmerich and whoever else was the engineering, it it was, uh, and and that's how how I I approach producing is okay. How can I and mixing too, for that matter, is how do I realize that their vision? You know I mean, it's not my vision. It's the, their, and whatever they want to do, I'll try to figure out how uh, the best way to do it that's that's going to work, or I'll try a few different things. John was gave me this great line. He said, if the artist doesn't call him in the middle of the night and say, is this a total piece of crap? If those words don't happen, it's not a good record. <laughs> they have to be insecure that what they're doing is not the same old thing. That they're right. like trying to do something new and is it going to work, yeah. right? I thought that was amazing. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Well, that, that's why he's a great producer, uh -huh. you know? Because <laughs> he knows that and he's aware of it and he's not scared by it, you know? Right. So we're, we're at the Apogee booth and you're going to tell me a little about some Apogee stuff. But before you tell me, so what's better about recording and making records now than it was, let's say, in 1980? Uh, geez, that's a tough one. All right. You didn't, I don't know if there's anything better. Oh, we got more tracks. Okay. But, that, but that's good and bad. Right. You know, it's good because you can, it, it's easier to do stuff, but then people, I think, misuse it a lot because mm -hmm. you can have unlimited numbers of chances to record something. Right. You never have to erase anything. Right. And, and so you should just bury yourself in options, which is, right. I don't think, a good thing. In the old days, you know, the Brian Adams records that we did together, we had 20, not even 24 tracks, 23 tracks. There's always one track for time code. But, uh, you know, you had, if, if you didn't like the guitar solo, you'd have to erase it and do a new one. Right. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, but do you uh, think that made it, that, that actually was a help? I think Because people I think had to do was. performances as opposed to, like, to fixing things Absolutely. later? Absolutely, yeah. You know, you couldn't just, it was really, I mean, you could, but it was really difficult to sing one chorus and then paste it into all the other choruses like uh -huh. people do nowadays. You know, and you couldn't, you had to sing in tune. Oh, How about man. that? <laughs> That's a problem. Yeah, and you couldn't quantize stuff. You couldn't like go in later if, if things were out of time and then just fix it. You know, not, nowadays, you know, I, I heard a, a, a producer I worked with a few years ago, we, we did a take and we were moving pretty quickly and the take, to say the take wasn't that great. It was like almost, it almost got it. And and he said uh, th that'll that'll clean up real good in, in uh, elastic audio, you know. Okay. It's, it's, so he said it was close enough. We can just make it make it right later. Right. right. And you know, I, I don't know. I, I don't I don't go for that. I'd rather actually people play from start to finish, and what you hear is actually their performance. And right. even if you have to punch in. People playing together in a room. 
Yeah, people playing together in a room. You know, we so maybe, to... maybe, maybe music needs you to be a producer again to make that happen. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't. I don't think. I don't think I'm good enough. You know. There's so much psychology involved in being a producer. I mean, it's like being a director, and that you have to know what to say to the artist to inspire them to yeah to absolutely. perform properly. You know? Yeah. So what about Bowie? So you, you mixed Bowie, but you never recorded him? No, I recorded. The Let's Dance album, I recorded and mixed it all in three weeks. Yeah. Weeks. And now, would, would you consider that like his comeback record, sort of, kind of? Uh, it definitely kicked his, you know, that stage of his career well, into high gear. It was his, his kind of um, you know, reaching a, lot, a wider audience record. I wouldn't say comeback record because yeah. I was a fan of his. I mean... I actually liked the record before that more than I liked that one, but the Scary Monsters record, I, was, yeah, yeah, I pretty yeah, yeah. much wore out because I played it so much. And uh, I just loved that record. And then the Let's Dance record, as, as great as it is, was a whole different direction all of a sudden. Right. So, or more MTV. What's that? More MTV. Yeah, it was definitely, you know, he's going for a hit record. Right. Whereas Scary Monsters, he, he was just doing what was in his head, and I don't think he was... So what was his approach, though? I mean, how did, how did a session start? Well, first of all, he worked with, he hired Nile Rodgers to produce it, right. who was the big hit producer of the right. time. And, uh, you know, they, he really let uh, Nile take the lead on the arrangements, even though they were David's songs. And then even when it came to mixing, I was a big deal at the time as well. You know, I'd mix a bunch of big, big records. And he probably barely said a word during the mixes. Really? And, and just let us do our thing. Nile, me and Nile. I mean, he made but, some comments sometimes. And sometimes he, I'd go to try to fix something and he'd go, no, no, leave it just, just the way it was. was Bowie involved? Was he very hands-on in mixing? Oh, not in the mixing. No, no? He, no. he was involved in the, in the session, too, in the recording session. And he was there during the mixes, and he would, he was mostly uh, supportive. But yeah, man, that sounds great, you know? Oh, yeah? yeah? He seems like much. he'd be kind of like very controlling. You don't think so? Well, that's what I was expecting. Yeah. And he, there are certain, certain specific aspects he was very controlling. Uh -huh. There were certain things that he, he really needed to, you know? But generally, he wasn't. He kind so of what let, about getting his vocals? since you did a recording? Uh, he was like first take. Really? Really? Yeah, in fact, there's a great story I like to tell. Yeah. Uh, when he came in to do Modern Love, it was the first song we worked on was Modern Love. Uh -huh. And it was just me and him in the studio. He was out in the studio, I'm obviously in the control room. <clears throat> and he starts singing it, but he's, you know, it's got that talking intro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But instead of then going up the octave and singing it, that shouty kind of, um, vocal that he did, he kept the, uh, down an octave in that sort of big Anthony Newley kind of voice uh -huh, that he used to uh -huh. do. And, um, and he sang a, a verse and a chorus and then told me to stop. He goes, well, wait, hang on a sec. Just play that back for me. Okay. And so I played it back and he's listening, just in the headphones. He didn't come in. Just in the headphones. And then he, I stop at the end of the chorus. He goes, wait, let me think a minute. And he goes, uh, all right, yeah, do, uh, go, on, go again. Just take that again. Punch in, racing what he just did. Oh, really? Oh, wow. Yeah, and uh, and then he sang the way you hear it, exactly wow. what you hear now on the record. Stop at the end of the first chorus. He goes, okay, play that back for me. And he listens, he goes, yeah, yeah, cool. Okay, just punch in from there. Right, so he didn't even redo that. Uh -huh. He punched in, and it was like somebody somebody else walked into the, the room and started singing, wow. you know what I mean? It was just, it's like, wow, man, check this guy out. And then he finished the song. He said, okay, let's double it. We're done. That was it. Wow. Like, so were all the vocals overdubbed? There was no with a live lip? Yeah, yeah, they were all over. Yeah, I mean, he sang live with the tracks, but we didn't keep any of them. Oh, okay. he, he redid them all. Yeah. So what about recording uh, bands or music that you don't actually like? Is that possible? Can you yeah, do that? that? Can you record a, a band, you don't like them, their music? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do a lot of, I mean, <laughs> not a lot of stuff, but I certainly do stuff that I wouldn't normally listen to. Okay, that's I mean, I mix, I do mix a lot of re uh, French records, uh -huh. right? And they're great. They're really Johnny Halliday and so 
some of these people, uh, I've got a lot of French clients. How about German EDM? Have you ever done any of that? Yeah, not into that too much. I mean, I, I don't know. The, I might mix an EDM record, but I wouldn't be the guy to. Yeah, I don't you think I'd be the guy. Really call, right? I, I wouldn't recommend somebody to come to me to mix one of those. Yeah, yeah. Because, yeah, I don't really get it because it, most of it isn't really. I'm I'm about vocals and stories and songs. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's a good way to sum it up. Yeah. So, I, and here's a, it's this is a, such a simple question, but it's a hard question to answer. Um, how, do you, how would you describe what good sound is? <laughs> good, good sound is uh, something that's inspiring to listen to, which could be bad sound. <laughs> I like that. I like that. That's really amazing. Thank you. I, no one's ever said that before. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, because there's a lot of bad sounding recordings. And I, I mean, I love Motown. Motown yeah. is just, it, they don't sound good. Those are great sounding records, though. But the music is great, and it, it's just so perfect. It I, is perfect, perfect in its, it's own perfect. imperfect way. I right? love those records. Yeah. yeah. I you love know, the way the hook and the, and just the gets you, like, in the first three seconds, you're in. I know. It's and they're exciting to listen to, and they're oh, uplifting. Yeah. You know what I mean? Listen to the Ash, Ashford and Simpson songs. And man, they just put you in a great mood right away. Uh, you know, all that stuff. And, uh, but you know, I, I interviewed Holland Dozer Holland, the songwriting trio. Oh, you did? Maybe wow. 10 years ago. Oh my God. Last interview. And I didn't understand that whoever wrote the song was essentially the producer of the song. Yeah. Right? But that they, they wrote the song and then they had the band record it, yeah. but without vocals. They, right. didn't, they didn't write the lyrics until like a week or two later. Well, a lot of times they didn't know who the artist was. Right, they didn't know who the artist was. Right. And I said, really? That yeah. sounds like it can't possibly work. Although obviously it worked perfectly. But it was amazing to me. But the thing is, literally, they could write the song in the, in the morning and record it in the afternoon in a three-hour session. Tops, yes. right? Yeah. And they're all amazing. They're all amazing. I but know. maybe Those it was that genius. speed that made them amazing. Maybe and having a band that could just knock it out. That, that's a lot of it, you know? Yeah, it's I like, say. That's a lot. I mean, those guys were just genius. They really absolutely, I think. Again and again and again and again and yeah. again. And the records are just they're so vibey. It just make you feel good. Well, and I don't know that there's an equivalent now, right? I don't, yeah, I don't think there really is. Cause more, so much of the music now is just a, a, a guy with a mouse, you know? Right. And a computer. <laughs> Yeah. And then and then they'll bring in a singer and they'll do a hundred takes and then and then comp it down and then do another hundred takes and then, yeah. uh, then auto tune it and right. put it in time. It's like really? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, there's no just, emotional connection. Well, that's the thing. They can the producers tend to filter all the emotion out. Right. You know? and, and you were putting all the emotion in. Yeah. For keeping as much of it in there as possible. Well, that's what I tried to do. Yeah. 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 So tell me about these uh, Apogee plugins. Okay, well, first of all, Apogee has just started making plugins like a year ago. Oh, really? And it's they're really the best on the market. I, and I don't hesitate to say that. They really, because I've used them. And uh, but to a to a lay audience, what does what does a, a plugin do? Well, it's you know, there's equalizers that change the tone. There's uh, compressors uh, that control the dynamics. Um, there's reverbs. There's delays. I mean, so far, after, other than the Clear Mountains Domain, which is my new plugin, which is a bunch of delays and harmonizers and things. But but the other Apogee plugins are mainly uh, just signal processing that control dynamics and equalization. Okay. But they they're, like their mod compressor is. One of the best compressors I've ever heard, whether it was a plug-in or a piece of hardware. I mean, it was really, really good and really easy to, to operate and understand what it's doing. Just the way the, the graphics are displayed uh, in relation to the controls. And um, the Opto compressor is probably the best, in fact, definitely is the best plug-in Opto compressor on the market. So, but, sure. but, the, but the people buying them, they're people that have home studios or? Well, so far, it's, it's, they've been keeping a big, a big secret somehow. Okay. <laughs> the software. Apogee's such a small company, they don't have a ton of money to spend on 
Okay. Promotion, but, you know? but the people who you're, you're thinking are going to use this? Yeah, yeah, home studios, anybody mixing in a, in, in a computer, in yeah. a box, as uh, they say, um, would, would use these. And I don't mix in the box, and I started using them just because the Pro Tools is my multi-track. And, and I'm starting to realize, Jesus, if I just if I just put an auto compressor on all these vocals, it sounds every bit as good as if I go through, right, weeding through all these patch well, cords in my right. patch bay right, <laughs> and, and patching the real thing right. in. Right. Right. So, right. Okay. you know, I, I've been using them more and more. But then there's, now there's this right. one that we're just uh, right. introducing right. here at the show, this right. Clear Mountains Domain, this which is just, it's, it's right. a thing, it's sort of designed after all this stuff that I do in the analog world. Okay, okay. It's really hard to do in the box. It's, it's a, it's, it's a whole kind of a suite of delays and harmonizers, de-essers, um, the equalizers, and, and uh, it's, it's kind of the way my mixes tend to sound um, wide and how I get some get additional depths out of, uh, out of the mixes. I call it, uh, it's where your mix lives. Okay. Because it's kind of the, the environment of a mix. Okay. Because everything is, is always recorded fairly dry most of the time. Right, right. And so without any kind of reverb or effects. And this has has three different uh, reverbs in it. Well, it's got more than that, actually. Three, at any given moment, you can have three different convolution reverbs or impulse responses of real room. There's the Apogee Studio, which is like a very warm, sort of an ambient sound that it doesn't even sound like reverb, really. There's uh, the mixed disc chambers, which are my echo chambers in my studio, which are which I always tried to. Uh, they were built. They were designed to sound like Motown, actually speaking oh, really? about Motown. Oh, wow. okay. Cause I always liked that reverb, that yeah. bright, short, yeah. splashy sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the guy that I worked for at Power Station, Tony Bon Jovi, he uh, he worked at Motown for a bit as a mixer, and so he knew what what it was. He described the, what the chamber was to me. Okay. So these were kind of fashioned after that. So that's one of them. And then the, th the third slot is there's a whole, you can pick from a list of impulse responses of rooms that we've found. Okay. You know, a friend of mine's beautiful long echo chamber. There's a stairwell, there's a, a, a bathroom. Really? All right. There's a, there's a, oh, the shower in my studio. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you know, things like that. And then we're going to add to that too as we go. Wow. It's just, which is fun. It's, it's fun going and get, getting the impulse responses. So, I mean, your, your intended uh, buyer for these is our, our up and coming uh, engineer. Wait, that, sorry? Your, the, who's going to buy these things is up and coming, the young guys that are in this everyone. room right now. <laughs> everybody. But, yeah. I'm hoping that everybody buys it. Because it, it's exciting. It's the first time I've really shared what I do with okay. people. I mean, I gotta, I've been doing this for like, well, I won't say how many years. Yeah. Since the 70s. And uh, and the, all these techniques have sort of built up over the years as I, you know, I've mixed thousands and thousands of records. Right. And each time, well not every time, but very often I'll come up with some new, oh I see, if I if I send something into this left delay, then I can plug, plug that, send that into the right delay, I get this big sweeping thing, uh, you know, things like that, and I'll send that into a reverb, and you know, I get, and then it adds to that, and then I put that into some harmonizers, and it thickens it up. I put it, add a little distortion to it. You know, there's all these little elements, and you can do all that in this plugin. And like, like every one of those uh, those parameters is available for everyone to use. There's a bunch of presets, so you can start with something okay. that I've done that's similar to something like a Let's Dance delay, or a, or a Roxy Music reverb, or something oh, wow. like that. Oh wow! Okay. Know? But then you can go in and change it and, and, and customize it to your liking and to make it make it really match your piece of music. I feel duty bound to ask. This is my final question. Yeah. <laughs> and that is, so uh, where do you stand on the loudness wars? <laughs> uh, well, the way I look at, at the loudness thing is that everybody's got a volume control. Who <laughs> plays anything back? If you want it louder, turn the thing up yeah. you know what I mean it's like the loudness from way what I understand the way I understand is the loudness were started from A&R guys 
and at record companies, they'd have a, a big meeting once a week or something like that. They'd have the big A and R meeting, and everybody would play the project, whatever project they were working right, on. Right, right. And their, when they played it, their thing better be louder than everybody else's because yeah. it will stand out more, right? Okay, well, I don't give a crap about the A and I mean, not that I don't mean to put down A and R guys, but. I just don't care about that, you know what I mean? And I don't want it to sound distorted. Right. You can turn something up to a certain point and then it becomes distortion. Right. And certain kinds of distortion I love, but that kind of distortion, you know, I, I did a record once with this girl, uh, a girl named Landon Dunning, who probably never, nobody's ever heard of her. She's a great singer and the, the record was incredible. It was a real hard, hard edged rock record. It was very dynamic. and. The guy What's that the name of it before I forget? The album? Yeah, uh, the, it was called. Uh, I don't remember. Well, it's, uh, it's, spell her name because I know people are going to hear this. It's right. L A N D O N Dunning. Yeah. D U N N I N G. Okay. Uh, we'll find it. Okay. Yeah, I can't remember what it's called. But um, the, guy, the guy mastered it and he put it through like an L2 or something like that, which just smashed the hell, just cranked it to the max. And it just was all compressed and distorted, you know? And the, the artist, Landon, called me up and she was in tears. She said, what happened? What happened to my record? And the producer was like, what the, what's going on? And I heard it and I, I just, shit, a fit, you know? And, like, and I wrote this nasty letter to the mastering guy. I said, what, who do you think I am? He like, goes, well, everybody, all the NR guys want that nowadays. I go, well, I'm not one of those guys. I want to hear the dynamics, so turn it up to the point where it's not affecting the sound of the, okay. of the record and it doesn't change the dynamics. And they did? Yeah, he did. did I said, I'll tell it? you what, just just transfer it. Don't even do anything to it. Just just tra do whatever you can. Turn your equalizer, turn all your gadgets off, and it sounded great. It was fine. Oh, <laughs> you know? Thanks. That's a great story. I love it. It's a happy ending. Happy endings are good. Yeah, unfortunately, that would she got pregnant right after that, so she didn't uh, go on the road or anything. But the record came out. It made people I think listen. it came out. Right. Yeah, it did come out, all right, but okay. nobody, you know, it's a big secret. Nobody heard about it. All right, well, we'll, we'll all go and on Spotify and look for it. Anyway, my name is Steve Guttenberg. My guest today is the legendary Bob Clearmount. And now, you're not just a legend, you're a really nice guy. Oh, Thank thanks, you for man. taking so much time. Oh, my pleasure. You I did. really appreciate it. Thank Great you. talking to you. That was a blast. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.